Hello, everyone. Now, I know that it's hard to keep up on top of what's going on in the Holy Land, but if you want to know more about what's happening here in Israel, I'm Aaron Porras, and this is the Weekly Review. Starting with security, negotiations between Israel and Hamas terrorists in Gaza on the rocks. Gaza terror groups responding with increasing threats of escalations, particularly as agreements on the transfer of Qatari aid still undecided. In fact, Palestinian Islamic Jihad terrorists in the Gaza Strip are saying that an explosion and escalation are inevitable should the status quo persist. And this just days after the terror group broke the months of relative quiet with a pair of rockets aimed at southern Israeli civilians. Tensions are not just rising along the Gaza border, though. Jerusalem again becoming a flashpoint with an alleged Jewish mob viciously attacking an Arab man by the Machane Yehuda market. The 19-year-old victim now in stable condition but was admitted to Shari Tzedek Medical Center with serious injuries, and police are investigating the incident as a terror attack. The last reported incident like this occurring in May around the height of the conflict with Hamas. ILTV condemns all forms of violence. Now, in any case, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett meeting with Egyptian Intelligence Minister Abbas Kamel in Jerusalem, the two discussing diplomatic, economic, and security-related issues between Israel and Egypt, and Bennett likewise invited for an official visit to Cairo to speak with President Sisi within the next few weeks. This would be the first official visit to Cairo by a sitting Israeli Prime Minister since 2011, the last unofficial visit reportedly being by former Prime Minister Netanyahu, who took a secret trip in 2018. Now, in other news, from Cairo to D.C., Prime Minister Bennett setting a date to fly to Washington as well, where he'll meet with President Joe Biden for the first time since their respective administrations began. And they'll have plenty to discuss between Iran, Hamas negotiations, and, of course, the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Confirmed for Thursday, August 26th, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and U.S. President Joe Biden scheduled to meet at the White House. Bennett set to take off from Israel on Tuesday the 24th. And White House Press Secretary Jem Psaki saying that the visit will, quote, strengthen the enduring partnerships between the U.S. and Israel, reflect the deep ties between their governments and people, and underscore the U.S.'s unwavering commitment to Israel's security. The whirlwind visit not likely to last more than 48 hours, though, due to coronavirus precautions, and the time spent on very serious issues. First, coming off of talks in Cairo, Bennett and Biden set to discuss both security and peace talks with the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Then likewise, with respect to Iran, Bennett saying that the two leaders have already completed a process of formulating a coordinated approach. The currently dicier topic, then, being the consequences of the Taliban's victory in Afghanistan. The Biden administration facing significant criticisms over the way it withdrew its U.S. armed forces, particularly from foreign allies, who are now increasingly saying that the United States has lost credibility both to make demands and promises, and especially in the Middle East. <laughs> يعزز قناعة العديد من الأنظمة السياسية العربية بأن الدول الأمريكي في العالم العربي والإسلامي بين هلالين في تراجع. الفيديوهات وهاي على مواقع التواصل الاجتماعي وغيره كنت بتعاطف كبير معهم لأن أنا كم مريت بهاي الحالة قبل ومدينتي كلها كم مرت بهاي الحالة وأيضا يعني اكتشفت إنه هاي الدنيا ما بيها أمان. يعني ممكن بأي لحظة غدا بعد هذا يصير بينا نحن نفس الشيء بعد ما أو ممكن بأي بقعة من العالم يعني هذه النتيجة ستعزز أيضا من الشعور الدول العربية والأنظمة العربية بأهمية إيجاد تحالفات دي. And I'm moving north. Syrian state media reporting that Israeli missiles struck a military outpost in the Kunetra province of southwestern Syria Tuesday night. And the outpost near the Druze town of Hadar allegedly belonging to Iranian terror proxy Hezbollah, with the UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights corroborating that Iranian-backed militias were operating from that same site. Additionally, it's worth noting that this is not the first time this outpost has been targeted, with reports of a similar attack dating back to July 2018. The IDF still keeping close to the vest, though, with respect to active operations in Syrian territory. And in any case, no casualties have so far been announced from the overnight strikes. 
only material damages largely resulting from a fire that broke out. Starting with some breaking news, rocket sirens sounding in the town of Sterot and the surrounding southern Israeli communities. And a surprise attack breaking the relative quiet between Israel and Palestinian terror groups in Gaza following a ceasefire reached at the end of 11 days of fighting early in May. The Palestinian Islamic Jihad terror group claiming responsibility for the rocket, saying that the rocket was in response to an early morning shootout in the West Bank. In the meantime, from the IDF's perspective, officials are confirming that a rocket was fired from the Hamas-run Gaza Strip, with the Iron Dome defense system firing off at least one interceptor missile. And thankfully, while the IDF looking closely into the matter, so far there are no immediate reports of any injuries or damage. Now heading to Israel's southern border, Israeli tax authority officials confiscating some 23 tons of chocolate bars heading to the Gaza Strip earlier this week. And the shipment was intercepted on its way to Gaza as it passed into Israel from Egypt at the Nitzana border crossing. Because apparently, the chocolate was intended to help directly fund Hamas terrorism. Think Girl Scout cookie fundraisers, but for rockets instead of a nice camping trip. In fact, IDF Intel revealing that the order for the chocolate bars coming from importers working alongside two Gazan companies belonging to the Shamlach family, the al Mutahidun currency exchange and Arab al-Sin both of which are categorized as, by Israel as terror groups that use their sales to finance Hamas's military wing. And this has further evidence that Hamas has overtaken Gaza's import industry with respect to even the most basic commodities, all in order to bypass Israeli and international sanctions and blockades to fund the terror group. Defense Minister Benny Gantz, though, saying that Israel will continue to pursue terrorism's funding no matter what form it takes. We begin tonight with a shocking surprise murder. 50-year-old Sachar Ismail shot dead Sunday morning outside of his home in the northern Israeli town of Rame, and various officials are now sending their condolences, eulogizing Ismail as a kind, loving, honest, and brave leader. Ismail was number 17 on the New Hope party list under Justice Minister Gideon Saar. He was acting senior advisor to the Ministry of Education on Arab Affairs, and he's survived by his wife and his four-year-old son. Now, as for why Ismail was killed, a motive has not yet been found definitively, but police are assuming the attack to be premeditated, and they are opening an investigation. What we do know, according to the local mayor, is that Ismail was gunned down by unknown figures wielding automatic weapons, at least 20 shots reportedly fired. We also know that the Arab-Israeli sector has long been plagued by violence, primarily from organized crime. And people close to Ismail claimed that he had been recently receiving threats after vocalizing his intentions to use his government connections to fight the local crime syndicates. Several Arab-Israeli political leaders likewise calling the murder an assassination and proof of how out of control the violence in the Arab sector really is. In fact, over 90 percent of the shootings and 60 percent of the crime in Israel in all of 2020 took place in Arab communities, despite Arab Israelis only making up 20 percent of the general population. Additionally, since the start of 2021, at least 58 Arab Israelis have been killed. The Arab public, for its part, blaming police for allegedly failing to combat the criminal groups and ignoring the violence, including family issues, violence against women, and underworld turf wars. Moving on, coronavirus cases still rising in Israel amidst the spread of the even more highly infectious Delta variant. Nearly 60,000 active cases now in Israel, with just under 1,000 people hospitalized, 600 of whom are in serious condition. But as far as regulators go, not much has changed. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett rebuking those who are calling for a lockdown and expanding the vaccine campaign instead. In fact, all Israelis over age 12 may soon be eligible for vaccine booster shots. Hannah Rifkin with the report. With the school year and the high holidays quickly approaching, criticisms of the government's handling of the pandemic seemingly growing many even calling for preemptive lockdowns. But Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and the COVID cabinet still rebuking such talk. כדי שבעלת מכון כושר לא תיכנס לחובות עד סוף ימיה, כדי שהילדים שלכם לא ייאלצו לדהות 200 ימים מול הזום, כמו שהיה בשנה שעברה. The cabinet instead then pushing a more complicated solution, 
learning to live with the disease and simply getting vaxxed every so often. Health authorities even hinting to how third dose booster shots will soon be made available to all Israelis above age 12 starting in September. In particular, as early vaxxers and the unvaccinated making up the lion's share of serious infections. In fact, of the 105 people killed by the virus last week, 103 had declined to receive their freely offered vaccinations. Hanna Rifkin, ILTV. Starting tonight with some bittersweet news, the fires around Jerusalem have been put out. Most residents allowed to return home and no citizens have died. But the damages are immense. I think that the situation is under uh, control. All the night we uh, covered all the area and tried to fight with the small fires that we have in all the region. Uh, this is the main uh, situation that we have here. To my humble opinion, I think that the firefighters are doing a great job in fighting with the fire all over uh, Jerusalem. We defense now the hospital of Adassa and Karem that the fire will not get there with a lot of uh, firefighters all over and with the firefighters uh, f uh, fighters that we have in the air and we combined all this together with the uh, IDF, with the Homeland Security of uh, the IDF, with the police and uh, I think that we are going to do a good job. It's very hard uh, but we are uh, on it. Israelis applauding emergency service members as they wrestle with the remaining embers of one of the nation's largest ever wildfires. Over 20 water bombers and specially outfitted planes and roughly 1,500 firefighters, including from the Palestinian Authority and abroad, included in the efforts lasting over 52 long hours. But Fire and Rescue Services Commissioner Dedi Simchi is announcing Tuesday evening that the blaze had finally been contained. All residents in the area allowed to return to their homes, with the exception of patients at the Eitanim Hospital and specific homes in Ramat Raziel and Givati Arim. Still, a feeling of unease remaining among the ashes. Over 6,000 acres, or nearly 9.5 square miles of land, have been devastated, and officials are putting blame in human hands. Investigations are still ongoing, though, as to whether it was by negligence or intention. And now for some celebratory news. The first Israeli baby to be born in Dubai has finally arrived. And the baby girl born on Saturday last week, perfectly coinciding with the first anniversary of the signing of the Abraham Accords between Israel and the UAE. The head of the mission for the Israeli consulate in Dubai, Ilan Stolman, and his wife Jackie welcoming their daughter Maya, who was delivered by an American Muslim doctor at Dubai's Mediclinic Hospital. Maya is, Maya is the Stolman family's fifth child, and the first ever individual to receive an Israeli passport on UAE soil. And Stillman's adding on social media that we are especially delighted by the symbolic timing of her birth, with the head of the mission also noting the outpouring of congratulatory wishes that the family has received from both local and Israeli officials. Now moving on, although the 2020-2021 Tokyo Olympics are over, Israel and its champions are still celebrating. Yesterday, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and President Isaac Herzog hosting a special ceremony to honor Israel's largest and most successful delegation in history. And uh, I want to show you now a little look at what Linoy Ashram and uh, Artem Dolgopiat, our two of our three gold winners, had to say. <laughs> כשהיינו כאן בחודש יוני, לפני בסך הכל חודשיים, נרגשים וחוששים, ימים ספורים לפני הרגעים הגדולים של חיינו, על הבמה הכי גדולה בעולם, העזנו אולי לחלום על זה. אבל לא לומר בקול רם. בספורט התחרותי, עבודה סזיפית של שנים, מתנקזת לשעה או שעתיים של מבחן. כשעיני העולם כולו מסתכלים עלינו, מסתכלות עלינו. אולי זה גם ככה בחיים, ואפילו בגדול יותר. שתיים או שלוש החלטות, אחרי עבודת הכנה משמעותית, יכולות לקבוע איך תראה המציאות של כולנו. Right, joining me now, obviously, with more uh, news related to the Olympics, is none other than Hanna Rifkin. Hanna, thanks so much for being with us. Now, what's going on here? Pleasure to be here. Now, you could feel their graciousness watching this. Mm -hmm. Linoy related to the warmth she felt from everyone in Israel just before this, and she brought to life that feeling that's, that you or I or anyone really could get from, I worked hard for so long, and it all comes down to a few minutes or a few decisions that could change reality. 
In her case, it's on the world stage, and it becomes a part of history. All right, well, yeah, I, I, it sounds like an incredible feeling. I mean, I can't imagine what it would be like to, to come home with a gold medal like that. But uh, let's talk a little bit more about, about the ceremony. Uh, it was filled with songs, speeches, and, and what else? Yeah, so songs, speeches, um, songs from the IDF. They came the IDF uh, band. And um, of course, the national anthem at the end. Um, like you said, President Herzog and Prime Minister Bennett both spoke along with some others. Um, Herzog mentioned um, that him, Rivlin, and Rivlin's son, they were representing Israel at the Olympics as visitors, and they watched everyone. And I quote, he said, all the ones who won medals, those who gave everything they had, those who were so, so close, and he said they were on the edge of their seats. Um, he even said, you gave us a lot of heart attacks. Um, we were there to watch every effort. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting after a year and a half of COVID, I have to say, to, and also a conflict in May uh, with Gaza and also internally within the country to have something positive to bring us together. So It's a, a renewal of, of pride in a way. It's some, something to be really proud about coming together behind, uh, behind these incredible athletes. Uh, Bennett also made a, a point of, of, about the importance of hard work and patience, the payoff which uh, Linoy spoke of earlier that you mentioned. Uh, she said it so many times, push until you feel like you can't and then push some more. Uh, you know, so that's, it's, it's really incredible. Is there anything else you wanna share with us, Hannah? Yeah, I, you know, Bennett, he keeps coming back to you. Did it for the kids. The kids are watching you. All the kids are watching you. And it really shows that, you know, hard work is the only way to get, to achieve your dreams and to get what you want. You don't get anything out of instant gratification. And I think it's really great how these Olympians, all the Olympians, whether they won medals or not, they have, they have accepted this upon themselves as being role models for, for children, for youth of Israel. So I think that's really great. All right, yep, leading the next generation. Couldn't be, couldn't we, we couldn't have had a better delegates for couldn't that. Couldn't be prouder. Couldn't be prouder. <laughs> Hannah Rifkin, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Our final story tonight, huge news from central Israel. Ramat Sharon, just north of Tel Aviv, celebrating its 100th anniversary. But life in the area going back at least 1,500 years to the time of the Byzantine Empire. At least this according to new evidence unearthed by Israel Antiquities Authorities. The discovery including a large wine press, a gold coin, and a bronze chain. Of course, for more details, we turn now to our favorite archaeological segment, Can You Dig It? with Israeli tour guide Anat Harel. Anat, welcome back. Uh, this thing happens a lot in Israel, doesn't it? Yes. Hi, Aaron. Great to see you again. Yes, it happens all the time. You know, people <laughs> start building things and construction all over Israel, and they have to invite the uh, Israel Antiquities Authority to check out the place just to make sure that there's nothing there. And most of the time, they find they find you know archaeological remains all over the place. Yes. How how often does that you know, severely delay building plans. I feel like it's a lot. Well, you know, it depends. It depends um, what they find. You know, you're you're praying, oh, please don't find anything important. But when they find something that is significant, then either it delays it, but also many times the actual um, uh, people that are building have to change their plan or choose to change their plans a little bit in order to adapt to the new environment of archaeology right there in the middle and it actually creates some beautiful beautiful projects that are put together and it's this combination of ancient and modern that's that's actually the trend these days that goes in a in a cooperation between the israel antiquities authority and all of the municipalities that are trying to build wow so one day in in this ramat sharon area we could have an ancient the remains of an ancient city right in the mixed uh, with, with the new city that they're building there, which is very cool. Uh, all right, so what, yes. what, do you, what do you believe will be done, though, with all of these excavations now that the neighborhood uh, uh, will be built? Well, so first of all, they have to finish the excavations. Mm -hmm. And then I am sure that the people building the neighborhood will have to adapt and maybe create an archaeological park with beautiful lawns and pathways and archaeological finds placed all over the place, or even a visitor center to see like a little museum in the middle of the neighborhood or 
Whatever they want to build, the Israel Antiquities Authority is very happy to collaborate with the different uh, villages and cities that are trying to, to connect the local today's community with the ancient past. And so there's many different examples of different projects that enhance the both. So I, I guess can, let's talk a little bit now about what the discovery uh, itself was. We have a wine press. We have gold coins with, uh, with uh, Greek and or Arabic on it. I, I read, and then we have a bronze chain that used to hold uh, like a chandelier of, of some sort. Right, a chandelier that probably hung in a church. So we're talking about finds from the 5th and 6th centuries, which were the Byzantine times in the land. The Byzantine times were Christian. The majority of people were Christian. However, they found a coin that has the year 638 R 639 on it, that is exactly the year that the Islamic armies arrived and conquered the land. So it's right on the cusp between the Christian times and the Islamic times. So it's actually very interesting right there on the scene between the two. Wow. And yeah. then and and this gold coin seemingly reflects that that change. Because I as I said, I understand it, that it has two languages inscribed on it. Right, right. It's It's got the year on it, and it has something in Greek and something in Arabic on it as well. So it's also Byzantine and very cool. used for both for both uh, empires. Very, very cool. All right, well, yeah. I, I'm loving all these uh, exciting finds, and I'm sure that we're going to find another one because we're always developing in Israel, as we've said. Anat, until the next Can You Dig It segment, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Aaron. And that's it for ILTV's Weekly Review. I'm Aaron Porras. See you next week.